Moya Bailey, welcome to the Beirut Banyan. I want to start with a story of how I met you. When I first started uh, working at Lyon, I was assigned many uh, energy stories, and one of them was the Iraqi fuel deal. And we couldn't find the Iraqi fuel deal, actually. So <laughs> Abi, which, who was my boss at the time, asked some Reuters journalist to send it to me, and I talked with that journalist on the phone. And she sent it to me, and I found it surprising that someone like, Maybe we're not in a competition like Reuters and Lyon today, but still I found it impressive that someone would send a deal for me. And after I wrote the article and it was published, that journalist told me a great article, even though I did not know the person. Um, a year or two later, I like I was starting to know about you because you were Tala Ramadan's mm -hmm. boss at Reuters uh, Thompson. And like she, she obviously liked you. And uh, I met you for the first time at Alias and we had a talk. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I needed something from you, so we were exchanging uh, numbers, and I was like, give me your number, and you're like, well, <laughs> you have my number, I sent you the Iraqi fuel. <laughs> anyway, so, but, and I know, and I know you don't uh, only do it with me, I know you do it with a lot of people. I feel that you believe in that journals are networks. I don't know if you do it with, like, competitors, we will not name them. But uh, I feel that, uh, yeah, you believe in that journalists are a network and they are like they collaborate uh, together to hold people accountable or to reveal the truth to the to the people. So I want to ask you, where does this uh, come from? Is it from a certain person like you are one of my along with Abby as well as Abby Seward, you are one of my inspirations to like be be like that with other other people. So where does it come uh, from with you, like from an incident, a person? I think, well, first of all, thank you for the very kind introduction, Rael. And, um, and you reminded me of the funny story. I actually forgot that yeah, you yeah. I was very embarrassed the numbers. About yeah. If you remember, I sent you an apology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no apology needed. But, but I think it, it, it really stems from the journalist that I got to work with when I, was when I was starting out as well. I didn't intend on becoming a journalist. I just kind of fell into it. I was, I was, I was working in Lebanon and... Um, thought I was going to be here for a couple of months and then go back to the US where, where I had graduated from university. And um, that summer, it was 2013, that summer was a very uh, heated summer for, for Lebanon. There were a lot of explosions that were taking place that were claimed by um, hardline Sunni groups. There was, the, uh, there was the extension of the parliament's mandate. And so I'm arriving and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Sure. Um, and there were a lot of really great journalists that were, that were very kind and generous, but also didn't baby me, which I thought was the perfect way to to be when you're trying to teach somebody something. Um, they were very helpful with their contacts. They always shared their contacts. They shared their perspectives. And then throughout the rest of the rest of my career, um, which I still consider myself kind of in the early days of it, um, throughout there were there was always people like that that were that were around me. And I was really lucky that I didn't actually have the kind of negative competition that that you and I probably hear a lot about. Yeah. Um, you know, people always tell me like, oh, if you cover OPEC or if you cover oil or whatever, the journalists are like cutthroat, you yeah. know, and they're like they'll trip you over in the hallway to try to try to beat you to a scoop. And I never had that, you know, I was I was always covering stories that that people really needed to rely on each other for, whether it was Lebanon, whether it was Syria, with all of the tragedies in, in Syria as well, and then onto Iraq and then back here. So it was it was a it was always an opportunity for me to learn from other people. And I thought, you know, you you pass it on always. Yeah. So if people were that kind to you as you were getting your 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 start, then then it just makes sense. And then I think ultimately it creates better journalism. I think if everyone wanted to adopt a very cutthroat competitive practice and they did it that way, the reader, the public would not be well served by that because you would be more focused on figuring out how to screw over your competitor sure. instead of getting out as much information as possible. But having a healthy competitive environment among journalists is good. So it's, it's, it's good if you're looking at it in terms of you know, healthy competition. And I actually have helped out the competitor. When I was at AFP, I was covering uh, the Syrian peace talks in Geneva and the Reuters correspondent in front of me, um, who now are colleagues, but at the time we were competitors, he, his, his recorder stopped working as he was recording oh. a statement from Stefan de Mistura, yeah. who was the peace negotiator at, at the time. Um, and he turned around and asked me if, if I was willing to, to, to share mine. And I said, of course, because I'm not getting a scoop out of what just, you know, it was a public press conference. Yeah. So you, you know, you make your calls. If somebody else is going to ask me for something that I really worked on months yeah. to get exclusively, I make a different consideration, um, 
but no, I don't think you know. I think healthy competition is 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 good, but I think healthy collaboration is is yeah. even better. Yeah, and I think because of people like you, I think in Lebanon, I don't know about. I've never worked in another country, but I think the environment is not as toxic. So mm. thankfully, opinion. yeah, yeah, thankfully, my opinion. Let's uh, talk about uh, the coverage of South Lebanon. Sure. Roni, when I when he interviewed me at uh, MTV, he asked me how I'm doing mentally, and I'm always shy to say that as a journalist, I'm suffering more than other people because like maybe we are but there are people in the south who can't uh, afford to leave their homes yep. and stuff. but uh, so I'm always shy to say that but uh, in your case this like aside from covering the wall and being exposed all the time we were talking about not skipping one not being able to skip one Nasrallah yeah. speech uh, you had uh, you lost a colleague and other colleagues were injured and you are responsible for them for their safety like the safety plans i i assume that you cooperate together so how, how are you doing on that uh, front Maya? it's um it's a question i still don't know how to answer i mean people ask me you know i saw was killed on october 13th people were asking me from the first moment you know are you okay how are you doing it's been almost six months and i still don't know really how to answer that question because it's it was really an impossible loss to bear because it was it was the loss of a friend, Isam and I were friends before I joined Reuters, the loss of a colleague, of course. But then on top of that, there was obviously the grief that, you know, as you said, you're, you're, you're leading a team and the grief that the rest of the team is, is, is undergoing and each in their own way. Um, and then the environment in Lebanon was very difficult. Um, obviously, the war was ongoing sure. still. I mean, this was day six. Yeah. So the, the, the war was still going on. And so we had to think about you know, the very real realities on, on the ground of that conflict. Um, and also, of course, all the criticism that Reuters received in, in, in the aftermath, which I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about. But, um, you know, right now it feels a lot easier than than those days. Um, and I think that that means that right now is when I'm processing the loss, really, uh, much more than I was in the first couple of months. And I think now that, you know, now that it's, now that we're operating, you know, back to our normal staffing levels in the office, et cetera, you know, we're really feeling Isam's loss. And that's something that it's really it's still difficult to, to go into the office every day and not to have him there. Could you afford taking some time off after that? I've taken a little bit of time off. Um, I, you know, unfortunately, I don't take my own advice. So I tell people, you know, you need to rest, you need to recharge your brain, you need to you need to make sure that you're, you know, that you're you're alert and that your brain is operating as quickly as it needs to operate because we're still not at a full scale war. So you can't be tired at this point. Sure. Um, so, you know, I need to take my own advice when I when I say that. But I think at this point, every you know, it, unfortunately, it's something that is the case for everybody. Right. Everybody is working around the clock. Everybody's expecting there to be some escalation at some point. Everyone's trying to read the tea leaves and figure out, yeah. you know, what's when when is there going to be a ground invasion? If there's going to be one, when is almost coming next? You know, you're just always kind of waiting for the next thing. Um, and you don't really realize that months in you're you're worn down and you're and you're tired and you're maybe not as sharp in your analysis or in sharp as in, in your questions yeah. as you as you as you want to be. So yeah. it, it, it it takes its toll. But I think the problem is that you know, you have an entire journalistic body in Lebanon that is that is facing. Yeah, that you are not way. like a normal journalist. You're a bureau chief, so like you can't actually take days. Like maybe you can, but you, have, you still yeah. have to follow the. But I will say, everybody on the everybody in our team works very very hard and um, and is very responsive even on their days off. When we we try very hard, obviously, to not bother them on on their days off. But I think you know in in. One of the reasons that Reuters is such a strong team in, in Lebanon and really in, in other bureaus is that people have very, very strong sources. And that means developing relationships on a very kind of individual yeah. level over time. Yeah. So even know. when it's slow, you are working on that. Even when it's so, well, you're working on that. And also when someone is off and they have the perfect source for this story that you're trying to confirm. They're not actually off. Do you have to ask them, yeah. you know, and, and thankfully we have such a a, a really collaborative, energetic, you know, uh, wonderful team that everybody is, is willing to pitch in when you need to pitch in. But, you know, again, that's not necessarily sustainable for forever. Yeah. <laughs> right. Let's talk about October 13th. Sure. And I know it's a very sensitive top, uh, subject and I will try to be fair like to you and to the criticisms that, uh, that were uh, given to Reuters. October 13th, I, I had a shift myself. First of all, like, um, 
because I had to ask you if it's true, I was doing my job. It's it was one of the ugliest feelings I felt because like I was doing my job, but I know it's a tragedy. So anyway, you get you get what I mean. But like uh, as far as I remember, Reuters on the first day did not immediately say that Isam was killed. Correct me if I'm wrong here. When I'm yeah, sure. when you have yeah. an objection, let me know. Sure. Uh, did not immediately say that uh, Isam was killed by Israel. Uh, not until the next day that they said eyewitnesses, like a videographer, if I remember correctly, from the team, identified that the fire came from uh, the Israeli side. And Reuters got a lot of criticism for that. One of the, I mean, I, I will ask you why Reuters was hesitant to, uh, sure. to make such a call. But one of the criticisms was, even if they were not sure about uh, where they, like 100% sure about where the fire came from, Someone said, someone told me, I would prefer to be wrong and then a 0.001% chance of being wrong and maybe file a, a correction later than like doing what, what they did. This is one mm -hmm. of the criticisms. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's mm -hmm. my opinion. Mm -hmm. So can I start? Can I start with that, with, the, with those sets of questions? First of all, why? Why? Yeah. Why were just didn't immediately say that, that the Israeli military was responsible? Um, I've thought about this question a lot. I've been asked this question a lot, and I've thought about this question a lot. You know, from that from that night um, onwards. And I think, if somebody had asked me that night, you know, if an editor or if the story was published and we had said that um, Israel fired, that f Israel killed Isam, or Israel fired on 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 the journalists, and somebody asked me, well, what kind of weapon system was it? Where did they fire it from? Was it in the air? Was it from a ground? Was it a rocket? Was it a tank? Was it? I wouldn't have been able to answer any of those questions. And I think, you know, as journalists, what's the first thing that we learn? We do the who, what, where, when, why, how, right? And we weren't able to answer a vast majority of the simple basic questions that we needed to, to answer. Now, when we move on to the video journalist that we were citing that, that said that the fire came from the direction of Israel, it was the same for him. So he was able to say that the fire came from the direction of Israel. Yeah. But he couldn't, he couldn't, I, we asked him, was it from, could you tell if it was from the sky? Was yeah. it from the ground? Was it, do you know if there were two different things because there were two different strikes? Were the two? None of those questions he was able to answer in, in, in those first 24 hours. And to, to address what, what the, the person that you mentioned who said that they'd rather be wrong and issue a correction. They're saying this like it's quote unquote out of respect to their colleague. That sure, that's fine. I, but I, I, I would rather be right. Yeah. I'd rather I would rather never be wrong yeah. ever. And I think especially in the context like this, where we have um, where we have a very politicized context and a very um, the context in which every word that media organizations are publishing about not just the war on Gaza, but also all of the surrounding conflicts that have flared up since then. Every one of those words in those articles is being so carefully examined to try to poke holes in those articles, possibly, or to try to demonstrate bias, or to try to say that these journalists aren't unbiased, etc. We didn't want to be 0.0000000001% wrong yeah. on anything. And so what we did then is that we embarked on a two-month investigation to produce a report that could not be criticized by anybody, that mm. could not be criticized by a reader, um, by by the Israeli military, by anybody within Lebanon, etc. So what we really wanted to do was be 100% right in what we published and not give anybody any reason to doubt what Reuters would publish in the future. But even before the investigation, again, on day on October 14, mm -hmm. I woke up to the news, Reuters saying the fire came from uh, the Israeli side. Sorry. So right. maybe is it because after the criticism that Reuters got, you felt that we it, needed to correct? No, actually, no, it's not the correction. Or we needed we needed to kind of provide more information. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Actually, that that was an update that was published overnight. Um, it was published kind of in the early hours of Saturday morning at around three or four a.m. Um, and it was not as quickly as we would have liked that update to come out. But as you can imagine. On our side, it was an entirely different experience than a lot of other outlets that were writing about Isam at the time. Um, we had to inform his family. Um, we had to um, we had to inform his friends in some cases. Um, we were getting you know we were getting a lot of pressure from from uh, you know obviously from the public criticism from the initial statement. So it was a really difficult time for us, and we were we were really focused on trying to make sure that we were publishing 
everything that we knew to be true and just that. Mm. And so it took us, it took us, um, it took us some time for to pu to publish the investigation two months later. What we wanted to do also, we wanted to rely on statements that we could, that we felt were solid. And so we published Never that update. That. Exactly, we published that update overnight the next day. And in, that update also included the accusations from Prime Minister Najib Mi'ati, from Isam's mother. Um, and then the next day we had the army publish their statement on it, identifying it as a, as a 120 millimeter tank round. Is it, is it, I mean, some people said that in this, in such cases, because it's too big of a claim to accuse Israel of killing your own journalist. Is it usually these calls, are they your code? Because like rumors were saying you were pressured from people above you to like be hesitant on saying that Isam was killed, immediately saying that Isam was killed by Israel. Is it the case? How, how truth is it? No, there was no pressure. Okay. There was no pressure, but there was just obviously an extraordinary amount of scrutiny. Yeah. We wanted to make sure that every word that we published could not then be doubted. So you were on the same page. I won't, I won't go into the details of what was happening kind of internally, but I think, you know, as you can imagine, we were trying to gather as much information as possible in terms of the journalists on the ground. You know, I was with Isam's mother, so I got the quotes from her. I was, um, you know, we, we, we saw the, the statement from Najib Mi'ati, Hezbollah put out a statement as well. And so we thought, okay, in, in a normal situation, in, in, a, in a situation in which we're not reporting on the death of our colleague, these are the kinds of elements that we would include in a story. And so those are the elements that we gathered um, and put together for the, for the update. So there was, there was not any pressure so I can I can say that very comfortably, um, but there was a lot of grief and there was a lot of you know I also had to be checking on Mahad and Thaer and making sure that they were out of the hospital and they yeah. were okay. Uh, I the journalists, the injured, yeah, I, I the two that. exactly the two the two Iraqi journalists um, uh, who were there for Reuters um, as well had flown in from from Baghdad and, and and went to cover. So there was so much going on that I think we were really trying to do the best that we could do professionally, maintain our sanity, maintain our professionalism, continue to do our jobs and gather those th those elements. Um, and um, what I will say is that it was not easy for anyone. You know, it wasn't easy for the Bureau to look at the criticism that was coming in. Um, it wasn't easy for us to know that it had caused so much pain um, not to see a direct statement. Um, it was, uh, and it was very, it was still a shock. Frankly, it was still a shock in, in those first few hours and in those in those first few days. Um, so I can very much understand that there was a lot of um, there was a lot of anger and disappointment at the thought or the perception that Reuters was shying away, or that there was some kind of political pressure, or that there was some reason that we hadn't we hadn't said it was Israel. But really, it was our attempt to do the best that we could do to the highest standards that we could maintain and really focus on what we wanted to produce in the end, which is which is proof. What we wanted to get was proof. What do you say to the criticisms that say that because Reuters is a Western news outlet, that it was nicer to Israel in this case, because they were afraid, I don't know, of Israeli reaction, if you guys immediately said that it's, uh, it's Israel. We were operating, all journalists at the time, and continue to be operating in an environment, like I was mentioning earlier, that is hyper-politicized. Yeah. As you can imagine, and as we've seen from various organizations like Honest Reporting and from other watchdogs, basically that look at that look at Western media in particular and try to poke holes in um, in the tweets, in the LinkedIn posts, in the stories um, of journalists and trying to accuse them of of bias. Um, Honest Reporting also accused you know Reuters of having been embedded with Hamas on October seventh, which are absolutely baseless claims. Um, we're operating in an environment where everybody is trying to find bias in everyone's stories. Yeah. Uh, For sure. And the ones on the ground, the reporters on the ground are doing their absolute best and working their absolute hardest to find the best way to tell the story. And what that means, that doesn't mean just finding the right words. That means going out and finding the right interviews, making sure that you're balanced in the people that you've interviewed, in your perspective on a story, in the way you're approaching a story, in your headline, in what you're writing, in every word that you use, um, you know, and how high you mention the death tolls versus how low you mention the death tolls in a story. This is this is how people are reading the news now. And I think in a way it's a good thing because people are now actually scrutinizing and, and looking for quality news, which is good. We don't want it to tip over into the other side where they're starting to doubt, you know, everything they read and yeah. everything. Becomes exactly. Yeah, exactly. But I think it, 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 what, what we've, what 
Reuters journalists have done, whether it's here, um, whether it's whether it's reporters who are working on on Gaza from Gaza, is that they've just really done their most, just done their utmost, just to just to be as as kind of as true to the story that they're seeing with their own eyes as they possibly can be, and the story tells itself. I see. And what about you? Because because we discussed your mental well-being before. Yeah. yeah. After the scissors. And, they, and there were a lot. I don't know if they knew that you were like, uh, it was against Reuters. I don't know on a personal level what you did. There was some personal stuff. But okay, okay. <laughs> how, how did you deal with it? Because you continued, you barely took some time off and you continued being like a functional, uh, hardworking. For the most part. Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, it's, it's the, the aftermath of what happened on October 13th is not about me. It's, you know, we, we had to, there were colleagues that were that were hurt that were on our team, obviously, Mahar and Tha'ad, who are back in Baghdad and who are working and who thankfully are in good health and they're doing okay. Um, and then you had, they were, I think, you know, they got off pretty lucky. And then you had journalists that were there that did not get off so lucky, obviously. Um, Christina, uh, Dylan, Carmen, Ali. So these are journalists that have also had severe physical, mental, emotional um um, impacts of what happens on October 13th. So I really was just thinking a lot more about them and about the Beirut office and how they were handling it. Um, and, and, and I kind of thought that that was a much more important thing to be focusing on. And that was, and that worked. I mean, that it, as in, I think it was the right thing to do. And I think it really kept me sane. Uh, that's on the kind of emotional level. And then on the kind of professional level, our mission really was to produce the best investigation that we could produce over the course of the two months that we worked on it, just shy of two months. Um, and that also just involved a lot of work and I had to learn a lot of things. Um, I had to um, understand the way that investigators work. I had to understand what chain of custody is for evidence and make sure to preserve that correctly. I had to spend you know hours and hours reviewing the footage that we had seen not just the Reuters, Al Jazeera, and AFP footage, but also um, Al Jadid, Al BC, Rai, um, Arabi Jadid, like everybody that was on that was on on the ground that day. So honestly, it was I was kind of operating on those two tracks where I was just trying to do the investigation, and then I was trying to provide, if I could, um, you know, as much emotional support as I could to the people around me. Is there any lessons uh, learned from that? Uh like an uh, intense incident uh, on a personal level, Maya? Managerially, journalistically, would you have done something differently? Um, in terms of the decisions to send the reporters to cover th there, or or just, so let me no, rephrase no. that. Yeah. Like the reporting, the way you guys dealt with the, it's, it's again, I'm saying. From October. On October 13th. No, no, I'm saying not October, not after October. Mm -hmm. So I went on October 13th from that day. Would you have done something differently? Is there a lesson learned on how you covered that uh, incident? And uh, yeah, I think the work that was done by the reporters on the ground that were here gathering all the elements from again, from Lebanese officials, from Isam's family, from Hezbollah, from others who, who were here, I think they did their job exceptionally well. I think that everybody was operating again in, in a situation where they were completely shocked. Um, I mean, we really, frankly, couldn't believe it. It was, yeah, it was just, it was just too much, um, and so we just kind of put our heads down and just tried to work. And we were thinking about um, Mahad and Tha'ed. We were thinking about, you know, trying to kind of manage those different things at the same time. So I think everybody in those circumstances really, really excelled and and um, and came through in ways that, you know, was nothing less than heroic, honestly. Sure. Uh, let's talk about the investigation, Sorry. which revealed that. Uh, the journalists were clearly identified uh, as journalists. The uniform uh, that you guys yeah, summarized, yeah, mm -hmm. were clearly identified as uh, journalists, and uh, yet they were uh, they were attacked by Israel. Um, why would Israel target deliberately target journalists in Lebanon? What's the value of someone being there, mm -hmm. covering on the spot? Mm -hmm. So just before I get there, 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 were, there have been three things published by by Reuters so far on on Islam's killing. There was. A special report that came out on December 7th that was the results of us gathering evidence from the ground, fragments, um, uh, uh, a tail fin, um, hours of footage, 
et cetera, reviewing that. And that investigation determined that it was an Israeli tank that fired two rounds from Israeli-made weapon systems from inside Israel. And the exact point is identified in, in the investigation from inside Israel. And that's that was the and that is the kind of um, that was the attack that that killed Daisam. Um, and injured the, the other six journalists. Um, in the aftermath, then we followed up with um, another story in March that was focused on an additional result from the lab TNO in The Hague that carried out the forensic analysis on the fragments that we brought and also carried out analysis of the footage that we had, that we had um, brought to them. And so their full report also uh, analyzed the sound of gunfire after the two tank rounds and determined that the gunfire was um, coming from a Browning 50 caliber um, gun. And most, and, and Browning 50 caliber guns can be mounted onto, onto Merkava tanks. And they had determined that the likely scenario was that a Browning 50 caliber based on the velocity, based on the sound analysis they had carried out, that the likely scenario was that a Browning 50 caliber mounted on the same Merkava tank that had fired on the journalists, then opened fire on them for, for a little over a minute. Um, so those are the two first stories. And then the most recent story is the um, story based on the UNIFIL's investigation as well that was shared with the Lebanese army and shared with the Israeli army and determined that, as you said, um, it was a group of clearly identifiable journalists and that there was no exchange of fire across the Lebanese border for 40 minutes um, leading up to the attack. Um, and, and, and that is a really crucial finding because um, in you know, if anyone were to say that there was an exchange of fire, that there was a it was an active conflict zone. You know, when people think about war reporters, they think of people dodging bullets and dodging shelling in two directions, and it's chaos. And that's absolutely not what what was happening on on the ground. So it's really important also to have Unifil publish that. And as a result of those two findings, they also they found that it was a violation of international law. Let me cut you on this one, just to, to get back briefly to what right. we were discussing. Uh, the, one of the counter arguments used, because you're saying there was no, the, uh, the uh, investigation debate, there was no exchange of fire. But one of the considerations you might have had is there might have been an exchange of fire. Because the, one of the counter arguments is who else other than Israel could it be that they fired at the journalists themselves at the time? So I think, so let, let me go back to the findings of our, of our investigation. Yeah. What we were worried about, or one possible scenario before we finished the investigation, was what if we don't have weapons fragments that can definitively determine the type of weapon that was fired? You know, what if it's something that everybody has? Everybody. Yeah. Um, that won't help us I'll determine who it was. Exactly. It won't help us. It won't help us answer. It could help us answer the what, but it wouldn't help us answer the who. Yeah. It wouldn't help us narrow it down. So. What was really important is that we were able to f to get weapons fragments and the tail fin of a, a, a weapon system that is made by Israel, and that was really unfortunately to you know it's unfortunate to use the phrase, but the it was the ultimate. smoking gun. Yeah, it was yeah. the smoking gun. Yeah. So it, that was that was why I kind of wanted to make sure that we raised the, those three points that it was an Israeli made weapon system that came from an Israeli tank and that was fired from within Israel. So at that point there was no other there was no other question of who could it have been. It was, it, was, it was those three points that were strong enough to say, now we can say that it was the Israeli military. And if anybody wants to ask us who, what, where, when, and how, we can answer it. To move on to the question that you wanted to ask, the question that you wanted to ask is why? And that's the question that we don't have an answer to. Hmm. And we have repeatedly, through Reuters, requested the Israeli military to divulge the details that it has around this killing to carry out a full investigation into this killing and to then be transparent about the results of that investigation because we do want to know why. We want to understand how, how this could have happened. Um, and we don't have an answer to that yet. What is the value of journalists covering on the spot that hypothetically another army could try to deliberately target them to prevent them from doing their work? Why is it very important for them to be in such danger to cover their, uh, what's happening in the South, for example? It's, it's what we do, right? I mean, it's, 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 you're asking me kind of what, yeah, yeah. It's, it, why, why do we do what we do? And I think, I think the, the, the most important thing for me in reporting is being able to provide a very clear picture of what is impacting the people that are living in a certain area. And so we want to understand the dynamics of the conflict so that we can understand the dynamics of how people are being impacted. And to do that, you have to be there. There is no better way 
to understand something than to actually be actually being on the front line yourself um whatever that might be you know that 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 is true for science reporters that is true for business reporters um that is true for conflict reporters as well so i think it's it's just inevitable that if you want to understand what is playing out you have to you have to be there because then you start to see things that wouldn't filter through if you were just watching it on TV from a thousand miles away. You wouldn't see it if you were sitting in your office and, and reading about it on, on some other outlet or on Twitter or whatever. So that's you have to be on the ground to really get the full picture. Um, and that's invaluable. I mean, the best stories are the ones produced by people that happen to be there mm. when something crazy happened. Is it worth the risk of someone being there and they're potentially getting their lives? Uh... Depends on who you ask. Yeah, sure. So I think there's a lot of people that um, yeah, that would say nothing is worth the risk. Um, I would say that my own, on a personal level, my own uh, assessment and my own kind of calculation has radically changed after October 13th. Um, uh, I saw would have said nothing is worth the risk, frankly. Yeah. Um, so so it, it, it really does depend. But I think ultimately, I mean, you know, I've I've had the opportunity to, to to cover other conflict areas where there have been civilians as well in in Raqqa, in um, in uh, Deir Zor, in Mosul, um, and I would say that you know in war you see you see you know and I'm not not the first to say this you see the best and the worst of humanity, you see the 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 unbelievable extraordinary amount of violence that humans can inflict on each other, and then you can also see the like thirst for life that civilians and that people who are living in these survival areas instinct, still yeah. have so. absolutely survival instinct but also not at the expense of somebody else um it's really incredible and Mosul, i got to meet this woman that was living in um living in her house in um in west Mosul. she she refused in eastern Mosul. sorry she she refused to leave uh because she was like if i'm gonna die i'm gonna die in my house yeah. I'm not leaving. I'm not going to die in a displacement camp. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die in my house. The house right next to her had been taken over by Iraqi security forces and, and was being used as a, as a base. And so she was very much, you know, it was, would have been very kind of probable that they had been targeted and yeah. she would have been impacted by it. But she was like, this is this is where I want to be. There's nowhere else that I want to be. And so when you see somebody like that who's being offered a way out and you can go live in safety and she says, mm, pass, I'm going to stay here. Every one of those little conversations, every one of those interactions and those anecdotes, they've built my worldview. Um, and so I think I, I consider myself really privileged to have been able to have those those experiences. You know, um, um, you know, people say like, oh, my God, you've had to cover this and it's horrible and you've had to do that. It's like, actually, you know, I, I chose the job as messed up as that is for us to choose a job that would you know put us in, in situations where there's death kind of all, all around us. Yeah. But at some point, you it, it's because the flip side of it always is life. So there's always a part of it where you see somebody who is so thirsty for life and mm -hmm. so keen on, you know, on, on living the life, living their life on their terms, that I consider myself very privileged to have had those experiences. Did the killing of Isam and the injuries and the killing of the al Mayadeen journalists and the injuries of other colleagues affect like the how much uh, or how often you send people to the to the south? So our, our calculations are very different. Um, and I think that is, that's normal. I think if we hadn't changed uh, the way that we do coverage in the South, then it would have been, it would have been very bizarre actually, and probably irresponsible. Because I think it's really important to remember the details of the incident itself. You had three outlets that were filming from a hilltop that picked that hilltop because they were visible to all sides. So that nobody could come and say, "Oh, there was a, some sketchy movement, and we yeah. thought it was we thought it was a, a fighter, or we thought it was a militant, or whatever." They picked that location because they had a view of the border, mm. but the border also had a view of them, yeah. and they were far enough away from the shelling that a lot of the footage that you watched from that day, they were actually you couldn't even see the impact point of the Israeli shelling. So they were actually so far away from Israeli shelling on, onto Lebanon, they were filming over a hilltop, yeah. and you could see the smoke. Smoke, yeah, exactly. So they picked a location that was determined by these very seasoned correspondents to be extremely safe. So when you have an incident like that and you have two tank rounds and then a minute of gunfire that hits a group of journalists that is very experienced and that had picked a location that they thought was very safe, then you have to reevaluate your security assessment mm. of the South. It means that the, something that you thought was not possible happened. And so, yes, we had to reevaluate after after that took place. We 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 um, we had to kind of weigh the, the editorial value of a story very differently 
because if it's you know if we're not going to go and film a live of of the border kind of indefinitely unless there's a really really good reason that we would be doing that mm -hmm. um you know if there is there a really good story for us to film in al mashab is mm -hmm. there a really good story for us to film in Oda or wherever and it's not just us there were other outlets that, that did the same thing and i remember afterwards there was there was a, there were a lot of uh, reports that came out and said you know international outlets withdraw their correspondence from the south and khalas and sahabo etc and people called me and asked me, you know, are you guys, if you like withdrawn everybody from Lebanon, and so, which is crazy because a lot of our correspondents are from the South. Yeah. So they're filming in their villages yeah, yeah. or they're filming in the villages around their villages. Sure. They are. The, Isam was one of them. Isam right? was one of them. Isam was from Khnem. Exactly. Yeah. But we have correspondents still now who are living in their villages and who are filming. Who are, sources or correspondents? No correspondents. Yeah, okay. team, like team members. Yeah, yeah. Or film, not sources. Yeah. Um, and, and they go out and they film from around their villages where they live. And... That means that you have somebody on the ground who was really well versed in the dynamics of the conflict, the choreography of the conflict. People started to understand, for example, that airstrikes were happening at a certain time and there were some windows in which there were not airstrikes that were taking place. There were certain roads that were getting more bombed than others. There are certain areas that were getting more bombed than others. So when can I travel through this area that is considered to be safe? You don't get any of that unless you have people who are on the ground and who can give you that kind of perspective. And so that's why it's really important for us to continue to have reporters in the South. And we do, and we, and we send reporters also to the South to work on stories. But did our, did our assessment change of what's worth the risk? Definitely. Kind of circling actually back to the what you started off with and the question that you started off with about collaborative environments for journalists. I think, as you said, Lebanon has a really healthy environment compared to a lot of other places in, in, in the world. Um, thankfully, I haven't had to work in those places, but you know, I hear horror stories from other places. I think one of the things that was the most painful after October 13th was that I felt like that was gone. Um, and, and that kind of, uh, that kind of, solidarity with the individuals and the members of the bureau who are who are here um, from other news outlets um, for, for a while it wasn't there I think it was very very difficult to, yes. to get for people to get through their day I'm not talking about me I'm talking about you know other people yeah. in our bureau who were really struggling with the you know not just the criticism of Reuters set that aside but there was also kind of a personal, you know, a personal weight that a lot of people felt when they were going out to try to cover stories. And that was very, very difficult. Um, I think we're past that now, which is which is really good. But I think it was just um, it was just a it was a really dark time uh, because of all of the pain that October 13th caused for everybody across across the board. Um, I think, you know, we, we worked really hard to to um, to put an account of facts out there that again does not have any holes in it um and that was really strongly um backed by the evidence that we gathered digital and physical and i think in, in the interim also as a as a bureau you know there are people in the office who have worked together for 20 years and have been through really tragic personal um periods but also tragic periods for the country whether it was 2006 or whether it was everything after that or before that True. or whatever uh, luckily that you know there was a strong kind of team that was able to to carry a lot of that that pain that that happened on October 13th and I think that you know I'm really proud of the way that everybody handled it here well, uh, thank you so much for letting me ask uh, these very difficult questions uh, we don't want to make you stay because you have not done that to follow <laughs> thank you back so to real life yeah thank you so much Maya. thank you keep uh, up the good work back at you thank you thank you